Everybody, welcome back to the High Performance Zone. Today, I have Dr. Bill, I'm going to call him MVP Howitt. And the reason I call him MVP is this is phenomenal, okay? Uh, actually, I think this is one of the most meaningful podcasts I've ever done. I've learned enough from Bill uh, for a lifetime here, and I think you will too. Here's what we really talk about. We talk about mental fitness, but how do you actually, what's the algorithm. How do you get mental fitness into workplace environment, psychological safety, these big words that are, you know, a buzz out there. Bill's got the path. And, uh, and it's why? Because he's done three things. Number one, he's lived it as uh, in his whole life, overcoming. He understands from empathy, by the way, uh, make sure you stick around to the end as we define empathy, redefine it in a beautiful way that helped me. But also his academic background, you know, this guy's got eight degrees, written 50 books. But I think the most important part is the way that he can translate it back to the workplace. And he's also has been in the business world in a big way as a COO and a chief um, CSO also. So chief of staff rather. But here's the key. Uh, I think this will help you not only personally, it's going to help you as a leader uh, and it's going to help the companies uh, create positive workplaces that create better results. So stand by. Enjoy this one. I'm actually going to listen to it again right now. Glad to be here. Ready? Hit it. Hey, everybody. I got Dr. Bill Howitt. And Bill, you and I were just catching up right before we started this. Uh, I'm excited to have you because I know how impactful this is going to be for our listeners. Uh, your background really intrigues me in many ways. Uh, so let's maybe if you could tee up the three buckets that you like to uh, define yourself by. And welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, John. I'm so glad to be here. And uh, I am kind of pumped up to have the opportunity to chat with you. So this is exciting for me. So the three buckets, typically when I do talks, John, I think it's important for people to have context because we all have some great messages, yeah. but our life experiences will have an impact on how we experience our world, right? So my buckets, I introduce myself as bucket number one, bucket number two, bucket number three. And bucket number one, Yep. I, I've spent some time in the world of mental health. I've seen patients for over 30 years. I have a PhD in counseling psychology. I did my postdoc UCLA. You know, I did some work in the school of medicine that wrote a bunch of books on addictive disorders, did a whole bunch of stuff in standards. I've lead research in Canada and workplace mental health. I've, I've published in that, created a bunch of books actually with John Wiley, have my own book series with them on addictive disorders. So I did all that stuff. So I've done enough to create the illusion. I know something about mental health. Well, I saw you have like over 50 books. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. And, and, so, and then in the middle bucket, I yep. have a lot of corporate experience. Well, so I think a lot of times when you see someone with a lot of academia, you wonder how they transferred into the applied yep. roles. I worked 12 years in Wall Street in various different roles from a chief of staff, uh, COO in equities, more in the world of finance. And I was always in the consulting role, filling different roles, helping really, really smart people help build their organizations. And I had the privilege to learn a lot for some brilliant people. And then in Canada, I was chief of research for a company called Morno Chappelle, which is LifeWorks now, as mm -hmm. chief of research for the Conference Board of Canada. I own a business who specializes in psychological health and safety. And the last bucket, bucket number three, is why I do what I do. You see, I feel very privileged to be who I am because I had an experience that lots of people I'm in the world of workplace mental health and understand, John, mental health, the impairment of mental health is intrapersonal disruption of thoughts and feelings yep. that creates interpersonal disruption. I live my entire life being a person whose they title is neurodivergent. So I'm ADHD, I'm auditory and visual dyslexia. I'm the kid who has grew up in a foster home. So I had trauma. I was adopted, went through trauma stuff, failed grade two, which was traumatic. Couldn't read or write till I was 18 is traumatic. Wow. You know, people kind of, you, you know, never feeling you were good enough. Plus, so me having these experience with anxiety, trauma, and et cetera, I have a different level of empathy to understand when human beings get caught in emotional disruption or dysregulation and engage in maladaptive coping, it doesn't mean they're weak. Right. It doesn't mean they're bad. It just means they're doing the best they can. So I've spent my life now trying to help employers understand how to help employees create better experiences for themselves so that they can show up to be the worker they want to be versus assuming they're not. 
Yeah. Wow, Bill. Okay, first off, so many things we can dive into. Um, what I really am excited about is that you've lived it the way you, you know, let's go reverse order in those buckets. I mean, yeah. one is uh, you, you've lived it, the challenge of, of a lot of things. Second is you actually researched it. So, you know, the, the academic behind it and then applied it already in the corporate world. And now, you know, taking it out to where we all need uh, this. And let me, let me ask you what this is. So when we talk about, I, by the way, I like the idea of mental fitness, right? You mentioned that earlier, you know, yeah. how can we bring mental fitness into the workplace, what is really, what does psychological safety really mean? And oh. how do we transfer that into the workplace? It's a great question. So I'll take a couple of minutes to explain it, to give the audience yeah. some context. Yeah. So, I, so if you think about the concept of psych safety, a lot of people might think it's about respectful workplaces and, and all those things around removing bullying and harassment. That's kind of it. Okay. But a psychological safe workplace is where people feel free to speak up. It's a mm -hmm. place where people show up where they can actually feel welcome included. They, a place where they feel they belong, where they can have purpose, where their voice matters. And so what happens is, is that organizations, we've learned some critical lessons from brilliant minds like the Amy Edmondsons of the world who've highlighted like, hey, you know, Wells Fargo and Volkswagen stories where there was silence and people didn't feel comfortable speaking up mm -hmm. resulted in some challenges in, in, that threatened the organization. What I try to get employers to understand, ultimately what psychological health and safety does the following, to be very simplistic about it, because uh, yeah, my most important mentor in my life was my father, who was a bartender for 30 plus years. Nice. Good stories wow. coming from there. Yeah, great, great wisdom. You know, and, and some people kind of mark me down about this one time. I said, no, I'm not saying this from a pejorative. My father was my idol, a brilliant, brilliant human being. Same and here. So I can't wait to dive into that. The okay. why, but, but keep going. Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. And so what happens, what, what it is, is ultimately creating a culture that focuses on promoting mental health. It's, and when we use the word mental health, people confuse that with mental illness. So okay. mental health is behavioral health, meaning how I show up and regulate my emotions and my experience in the workplace so I can be the best version of myself. Beautiful. As well as reducing mental harm, meaning hurting someone's emotions. And which, so we have workers now who may be bringing trauma in the workplace, trauma-informed workplaces or neurodiversion, no one knows who they are, or the pandemic crisis and financial crisis. Yep. They get people stressed out. So ultimately what a psychological safe workplace is, is much more than this. Is, this is a cool title. Yeah. What it really is, is every interaction the worker has in the workplace, very simplistic, can be a positive or a negative interaction. Hmm. So human beings, based on what's called the Los Ado ratio, L-O-S-A-D-A -A ratio, is 2.91 positive emotions to every negative uh, motion. So the world of uh, employees who are in learned helplessness, mm -hmm. meaning they feel disempowered, will spend a lot of time in languishing. Yeah. So employers, to get this on and to move on, is a psychological safe workplace knows we need to create a place where people can learn without fear, they can grow and become the best version of themselves which drives productivity, engagement, inclusion, diversity initiatives, yeah. all that. But what employers need to understand, this is not about programs and policies or trickery. Right. This is about learning what are the behaviors of how we interact with each other. So in essence, because resiliency, John, is built off of three things. The environment, your experiences, like pandemic has created experiences, mm -hmm. and what you learn. So everyday workers come to the workplace from a psychological safe place. People can be learning how to create more positive emotions, whether it's their leader giving them encouragement, mm -hmm. whether it's they actually start to believe in their own self-worth, their own value. And when we can get workers and leaders creating more positive emotions yeah. than negative, we drive creativity, innovation, empowerment, what team do you want to be on? One you want to be on where you have purpose or one where you feel you need to be there just for a paycheck? Right. And that's Bill, what wow. I think it is. 
Okay, you t- thanks for teeing it up. That, that's there's a lot there, um, and I, I do want to unpack it because sure. I think you're you're right. The idea of a culture of excellence, a culture of safety, you know, yeah. a culture of learning, growing. In fact, that my mantra that I've had for the last probably oh four or five months has been learn, grow, give. You know, and you yeah. just mentioned two of those, right? Learn grow, but I had giving on there. And then I realized, you know what? I got the order wrong that I want to start giving first. That allows me to learn. And then I can grow. Can I give you some coaching? What's that? I want to give you some coaching. Yeah, man, go for it. Oh, you know, they, so most of us like sex unless there's something wrong. Absolutely. Got it. Sex releases a wonderful chemical called oxytocin. Yes. Acts of kindness release oxytocin. Whoa. So acts of kindness floods our brain when we serve others before we serve ourselves, and it can help us understand that there's something greater that gives us meaning than above ourselves. And when we can find meaning above ourselves, that helps us have purpose to come back and do it again. You know that, thank you for that. And I'm gonna use that again, acts of kindness, right? Uh, oxytocin, right? I've never <laughs> made that connection. It was just interesting. Um, last night, I, I'm up here in Sun Valley, Idaho, and a, a yeah. buddy of mine uh, just did a film, a documentary called um, Some, Raising Your Summit, Searching for Your Summit. And um, it's about climbing Mount Everest, but really it's about his life. And it won the Emmy for this year for the, for the best uh, short documentary. He's a pro football player. I know you played football. We'll talk about that. Uh, Mark Patterson's his name, searching for your summit. Anybody who's listening should check out this uh, short documentary. It's unbelievable. NFL films shot it, but um, he just asked me to do uh, an event last night at the opera house here in sun Valley. And, and, you know, we, we did the filming, released the, the, the film to raise money for this, this group out here called higher ground, who, by the way, works a lot with people, um, who are trying to overcome PTSD and some of these others, uh, challenges. Right. But the whole point was that, um, he said, Hey, John, can you just kick it off, you know, and, and then we'll, you know, MC it and roll into it and do a Q and a, and, you know, I did this just, what you said, right? I mean, I did it because A, he's a friend, B, we're raising money and, uh, and, and you know, it, it helped, right? But the joy I got afterwards, I felt this uh, uh, feeling in my body. And I mean, I was, you know, talking to people, having, in fact, Greg Sugarwin, who is our producer here, he was there with, with his kids. And um, I just felt so good. And I started thinking back as I was driving home, I'm going, why do I feel so good? I mean, yeah, it was, uh, uh, but you just nailed it. Because it was all the oxytocin must have been released because it was all about somebody else raising money for others, helping somebody else um, get their movie out there. You know, you, you got a, a great new book coming out. We'll be talking about it. Yeah, but um, that's amazing that it, there's a direct relationship to that. There is, man. And I think it's the concept of many of us. I think many of us actually don't understand the algorithm for mental fitness. We know mm-hmm. what the algorithm is for physical health. Like if I said to you, what's the algorithm for physical health? And you would go, hmm, what does he mean? Most of you know it's exercise, diet, rest, lifestyle choices. I say, John, you make good choices. You reduce your risk for chronic disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease. You know, like 750,000 people on the planet die every year because of how work is organized, which is called hypocortisolism due to burnout. Uh. But if you go to an employer, and this is where my problem is, and, I, and I'm tired and I get frustrated this, a lot of CEOs deeply care about their employees. Yes. So they entrust people to put programs in place. And what we need people to start saying, hey, if we want to reduce mental harm and promote resiliency and mental fitness, we need to understand what is the algorithm? Nice. People go, well, certainly not, you know, doing this program or that program. The algorithm for mental fitness to get to the kind of work to do the kind of thing that you're talking about, acts of kindness, and I'll tie it together to you now, mm-hmm. is the environment. That's one formula. Okay. My experience, like the social determinants of health. So if you're home with domestic violence or food insecurity or shelter issues, those are big factors. Yep. But if you come to a workplace that's not safe and people are hierarchy and you don't feel welcome and you, if you're structural racism and you feel like you're a minority or you're code shifting and we're not paying attention to the worker's experience and stop thinking of them just as a machine because human beings, 
You ask me later if you have time, I'll tell you we treat photocopiers better than machines, and I'll explain why we do that. But what happens better is- Better than people, right? We treat photocopiers better than people? Yes, yeah, thank you for that clarity. Okay, got it. Yeah, got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. And, and, and then the next level is there's a genetic piece, like potential, like not all of us can dunk a basketball. So some of us right. make more serotonin than others. Mm-hmm. But serotonin is not made in your head, it's made in your gut. So your potential is impacted by your diet. So mental fitness, three elements. Yes, physical health, exercise, diet, rest. Sleep is by far one of the most important things we need to do mm-hmm. in lifestyle. Our quality of our social connections, starting with ourself. Yeah. Sadly, many of us don't know how to have self-compassion because we live in a society of perfectionism. And when you're stuck in perfectionism, the root cause of that, and I'm kind of an expert, why does someone get eight degrees? Well, because yeah. I- we were joking about that. You yeah, have because I never thought I was good enough. Yeah. So if I keep getting, you know, th- having three PhDs or two PhDs and a, and a doctor in education, crazy illusion, I might know something, but here's a rub. Yeah. Till I can learn, because when you have perfectionists, you're stuck in shame. When you're paralyzed in shame, you don't have empathy for yourself or others. Oh, developing a relationship with yourself so you can have a relationship with others is powerful. We need social connections. We need positive relations. Now, the mental fitness element is critical. Learning how to generate pro-social behaviors that create Mm -hmm. positive emotions. Mm -hmm. Learning how to manage our at-risk behaviors, meaning when we're caught in stress, instead of maladaptive going to a bottle of beer to change state or food. Yep. How to regulate that. And the third one, knowing how to ask for help. Okay. Understanding asking help is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. Yeah, strength and vulnerability, I like to say. Right. So we can teach mental fitness, then from a psychological safe part, why this is important is that if I can help my workers develop their mental fitness and help them flourish, they can better self advocate and say, hey, John, I feel good enough to tell you I think you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Versus when I'm feeling languishing, I'm scared, and I'm caught in yeah. fear, fear, I may not say anything, which could put me on risk for short term, long term, or getting sicker. Yeah. And we have too many employees, John, that don't have the energy you and I do. Yeah. We need yeah. to be mindful. How do we get to where we're at? It wasn't by luck. It was with a lot of support and a lot yeah. of practice and learning. Wow. Okay. So again, you, you got so much stuff here. Uh, I want to go unpack a couple. Sure. Uh, first off, what you just described is the culture that I experienced in the Blue Angels. And I think that's, and I think that's why we, had, we were able to execute at such a high level, why we were able to be on the road 300 days away from our families. Uh, number one is it was a safe environment, okay? Uh, you could speak your mind. You could uh, talk about, in fact, you not only could, it was expected. It was, that's the culture was just the opposite is that I want to, I call it laying on the table, right? Yeah. Which means I want to be open and honest. Let's talk about this. Um, we had not only respect for every single, you know, person in the formation, everybody in the company, every team, every role, uh, yeah. but well beyond that respect, uh, we had the five dynamics. And let me tell me if, if this equates to what you just said. Sure. One is we did have a safe environment, which mm-hmm. started with respect, but it had also a humility involved. We, yeah. we, the second was humility. We took, checked our ego at the door. And what we said there is this is about the we, not the I. This is about the team. Okay. Um, third one was this openness, this honesty, the lay it on the table. The fourth was we had accountability, but what it, really what we had, Bill, was personal responsibility yes. that allowed an ownership mentality so people could own the outcome, not just your role. Of course, you have to do your job, but you, you own the outcome. But here's the, the game changer. And you tell me if this makes sense, because I want to dive into this. Yeah, 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 please. What it really, the difference was we had what I call this glad to be here mindset. People were appreciative of just being there, you know, being part of something larger than yourself. That purpose, you know, was huge. It was, it was ambassadors of goodwill. It wasn't about flying. It was being part of something larger than yourself. And the, to me, the reason we could sustain uh, being on the road, the tremendous physical and mental, you know, challenges of flying like that was we all were connected to that mission. 
We yeah. all were aligned to that purpose and we all took care of each other. We really wanted the, the other person to succeed as best they could. So how does that relate to what you just said? To me, you guys are all, whether you would use the same language, but in my mind, when I see it, it's psychologically safe leadership. Oh, nice. Meaning you all understood your role, your, how your behavior could impact other people. High EQ, intelli emotional intelligence, social relationship. Okay. But you also owned your own behavior, two-way accountability. You all knew you're responsible to show up, yep. take care of yourself to help take care of other people. But what was interesting, I think is really important, is understanding what the mission was. Mm. The mission was to keep the mission going, meaning it wasn't just about today. It was about moving along. And so that whole concept that you said, glad to be here, I'm going to say something to you really quickly. It's yeah, interesting. When I was in a boardroom one time, I heard a bunch of leaders, senior leaders, talking about a couple other leaders. And they were talking about how they just didn't like people and they were really, really, you know, hard to manage. And, and I said to them, I said, I got a silly question for you guys, you know, and this may come out of left field. Did anybody ask these leaders if they like human beings and they understood that human beings will ask questions at the most inconvenient times <laughs> and that they'll have needs at the most inconvenient times? And a part of leadership is to serve an employee to remove barriers so they can maximize their opportunity to learn hit their potential and that it's not just you sitting down in a meeting saying, go climb that wall and I'll meet you at Denny's in three hours. It's you actually need to be on the wall with them. Yeah. And that's when I listened to you, you were on the wall together with each other every day. Wow. Yeah. We, um, beautiful bill. You, you, you unpacked that incredibly well. A couple of things that I thought I took back is, um, it's why it was important in the Blue Angels, the boss, which I was not, I was the lead solo pilot, call it a COO, just yep. like, you, like yep. you talked about with your, your experience. Um, but my CEO, we would call that person the boss. And we do that with affection. And that becomes their call sign. Yeah. And, and they get to keep it the rest of their life. Because once you're a boss of a Blue Angel, it's kind of like being CEO of Top Gun. Actually, most of the Top Gun's the training ground for the Blue Angels, by the way. I say that because it just kind of rubs the guys. But all the, uh, all the, uh, uh, the last three uh, Blue Angel leaders um, were Top Gun uh CEOs first. And then, and then they went to the blue angels. But the point is just that you could really feel it when you had that psychologically safe leadership, right? I mean, you can feel it in a heartbeat. Um, uh, which was interesting was on the blues, you're only there for two years. So this idea of you, the way you tapped into this idea that the mission continues well beyond was core to just who we were. Uh, you were there for two years in a leadership role. And then guess what? You get to move on. It's not getting fired. You just get to move on up and out. We called it right. right. And somebody else gets a chance to, um, to do, to, to take that role. So you had a deep obligation of not only, um, keeping the culture and maintaining the excellence, but, um, passing it on to somebody else. And I think that was critical. The other, the other element was that we actually flew the jets. You know, somebody just recently said, hey, you know, I'm really impressed with the management of the Blue Angels. How do you manage these pilots who are, you know, obviously highly skilled, uh, probably uh, pretty type A, I mean, pretty aggressive. And, <laughs> um, and, and how do you manage them? I said, manage them? Hell, we are the management. The boss actually flies. I mean, you know, the number one jet is the leader. So the leader has to have their hand on the stick, which is very interesting because now your credibility is tested every day, <laughs> just and tested with the best of the best. So you've got to be better than the best of the best. You have to be better, but you have to, you have to be able to be um, um, a leader, both in, in your thoughts and your actions, in your yeah. words and your actions and actions meant everything. So yeah. again, maybe uh, let's unpack that with your brilliant mind. I, I think what I really enjoyed from that story is, is that the amount of energy that would be required to be able to do that over and over is that you get fed from your environment, from your peers, but you couldn't have done it if you didn't do work to feed yourself. You would have to take nice. care of your nutrition. You would have to take care of your sleep. You would have to take care of your own positive thoughts. You would have to take care of your family responsibility. You would have to take care of your financial. You, you needed to charge your batteries each day and do work 
So you were ready to come in at 99.9%, the best you could, yeah. so that you could make sure that you weren't the weak link in that team's experience. Really brilliant again, man. I can see why so many companies hire you. If you haven't, they need to, because <laughs> very quickly, you are unpacking things that, you know, I've talked about for two decades now, but brilliantly, you, you, you ascertain it. Um, let me feed you some, some, sure, some feedback on that. Uh, absolutely, the resiliency was a, a self-motivation thing. I mean, we worked on it, right? So uh, the first thing we did was exercise, of course, uh, but with heavy weights. I'll tell you why we used heavy weights, because the, the tremendous G-forces that you have to endure. Did you ever see, have you seen the movie Top Gun Maverick yet? Last night, man, I'm ready. I, was, I went to last night to get ready for this. I thought you were going to start asking me about 8, 10 G stuff. So I well, had to get ready for Okay, we got it. We'll unpack the movie a little bit here real quick. There's so many directions we could go on. But just to 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 go back to your idea of because I think it's going to help people here, right, is you are responsible for your own wellness, right? And you have to um, you and you have to take some time for that, because if you don't take care of yourself, you're sure not going to be able to take care of others. And I like what you said about uh, it was your obligation to show up with your I call it your A game. You know, you said the 99.9, and I agree that that's true on the blues. It, it was one of those things that you can't risk the lives of others because you did something stupid. That was the hard thing that I wanted to always be. I was never afraid of dying. I was never afraid of the danger that was there. Um, I was aware of it, which is very critical because otherwise you can easily kill yourself. Um, but more importantly, I didn't want to hurt others. And so my whole mindset was do my job, be the best I can. So I don't you know, bung my wingman, right. Or, or do anything else. So, so, so I showed up physically strong, uh, mentally strong too. Um, we actually took time and maybe this is something that, in, in, that you can uh, already do teach is we actually carved out time in the work day for our mental and our physical fitness. It wasn't something that you did after you did your job, like, Hey, five o'clock's over. Now it's up to you to go work out. No, we realized it was so important that, you know, like a sports team, uh, yeah. that that was part of our training. We actually blocked out time and we worked out together, which really built um, chemistry and camaraderie. Um, we tried to eat well. I will tell you back in my days in the 90s, nutrition wasn't as big of a deal as it is now. But the idea of being prepared, uh, definitely hydration, you know, water, um, we would really hydrate because in a 37 minute air show, you could lose up to six pounds of sweat. That's, that's how much water you, you lose. Um, but and I will say the biggest challenge. So all we did is, is we did that right. Here's the biggest challenge. Personal relationships, right? Uh, your own family, your own, your own personal relationships, mm -hmm. because the team is pretty easy to, you know, handle um, relationships at the work. We, it definitely was easy to handle the technical flying. We could figure that out in a heartbeat. Um, but, you know, being, a, you know, being able to support someone who's going through, let's say, a divorce or going through, you know, challenges with their kids, that was what I found was the, um, the skill. Yep. Could, you, could you handle that challenge while your work environment is demanding you of so much else? So maybe another handoff to you. How, how does sure. that you said something there that I think triggered a couple of things. I want to actually pause for a minute to kind of go sideways just for a sec, because you made a really important point for me. I, when I look at psychological health and safety and workplace mental health, the one thing I try to really, if I get the ear, mostly I work with CEOs and senior leaders, but when I sit down with them, I say, listen, I'm going to make this really easy. We're going to, what percentage of your workers come to work because they want to, and what percent come because they need a paycheck? Okay. And don't tell. And, and so let's, and because what I want you to understand, the folks that are just coming for a paycheck could be discouraged. And a part of it where we say you and I are like, we're, we're like you and I are on the plan, we, but we already have the knowledge mm -hmm. and the skills and the attitude to take care of ourselves. Now, what we need to do is be mindful of people that are discouraged, which is about 60% of entire workforces. Wow. Haven't yet got the knowledge and skills. So if we're starting to tell people, there's Mount Everest, using your story, there's Mount Everest, we know you're not going to climb Mount Everest until we do some baby steps to get you ready for that journey. See, it only takes about nine months to make a baby. It only takes about nine months to learn a new habit, it's about 265 days, because really? what we need to do is move it through an executive function, 
through our emotional brain, 80% of all our behavior is emotion. You have between 12 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Your attention span is less than three minutes. You have a default neural network, which your brain is hyperly moving forward, back, jumping back and forth, all this distraction that can move us off our course. Then to get it to our basal ganglia to our habit center, which mm. creates those automatic heuristic behaviors like you don't think about. And that's why Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Peace Prize on you know, system one, system two thinking, establishing how we make shortcuts and thinking errors. With all that said and done, where I'm going with this is this. Employers need to understand to teach people mental fitness is no different than occupational health and safety. When I put a hard hat on and a safety sense of culture, and this gets to your point, John, why it's so critical. We talk about safety every day, over, over. Oh, it's a part of your job. We remind you every day, safety tips, safety tips, safety tips. Mm -hmm. You, part of your job, physical, time for reflection, time for passion, connect with my family. If we really want to actually prevent as much mental illness, by the way, World Health Organization says that by 2030, now it's going to be faster. The number one cause of premature death on the planet is depression. Obesity is a big issue. Loneliness, mortality rate, five times that obesity. So if we want to really reduce and population health, remove all the, a lot of this comorbidity, we need to adapt like mental fitness, teaching people skills needs to be, John, there's no goal line. There's never going to be a time you're going to put, Bella, put your hands up and say, hey guys, everybody's healthy. We can stop this stuff. It's like, I'm 58 my next birthday. I'm not going to get a card in the mail saying, Hey, Bill, you've been working on your health for the last, you know, bunch of years. You know what, buddy, you can drink as much beer as you want now and pizza by Jesus, do whatever the hell you want. It doesn't make any difference. That's not life. You want physical health and mental health. Those are, those are habits, John. So the challenge I have is we have to stop confusing information with transformation. Mm. Transformation is a lifelong journey that we do over and over and over. And so all I want to try to anchor so people don't get discouraged, because I think sometimes you have only taken X number of years to get to your skill set. Oh, man. Right? Yeah, started since, you know, as a kid, right? But definitely, yeah. And in fact, no, I'm with you. And, and in fact, I want to get into some of your background because you, you can show how you overcame so many cool things. So here, here's some things. I'm, I'm, I'm writing some notes because I want to make sure we go back. I yep. definitely want to talk about the habits of mental fitness. Sure. And you, you started to lay out, there was three, and I don't think I captured them. Environment, sure. I think, was the first one. Environment, your genetics is something you're born with. And the top mental fitness is that, Physical health, social connections, okay? And right. under mental fitness comes pro-social behaviors, at-risk behaviors, help-seeking, and the last big pillar is physical health. Okay. Your physical health, the number one thing you can do for your mental health is sleep and move. Yeah. 10,000 steps a day and have be future-orientated about have something with purpose, that's great for your mental health. Wow, you know, I was, my podcast last week was, just about getting out. The number one thing is getting out and walking, right? Uh, is, is could help so many people. Uh, and, you know, and then I, I was asking, you know, it, it's nice if you can get outside, right? I mean, like I live in Sun Valley here and it's beautiful outside. Yeah. I, I've got the green, the mountains. For some reason, that seems to help. Is there a studies about getting yes, outside? There is. Yeah, nature's very, very uh, healing for us. And we get oxygen, which is great. We get movement. We're a bipedal homo sapien. We do better standing up, moving. We much more. But it also what happens is it creates mindfulness because we start noticing, hey, there's the sun. And wow, there's that's cool. We we forget that we're not out in the future or in the past. We're actually in the moment. Mm. So then we actually moving towards our parasympathetic nervous system and we're re reducing our stress worry. So it can be very, very mindfulness can happen in many, many different ways. There's a lot of benefit to it. But walking outdoors every day you can for 10,000 steps is wonderful. You know, you'll get the same benefit. Research says around 7,500, but 10,000 is a lovely target. Well, how far is 10,000 steps, roughly? I know it varies. Um, yeah, it's about an hour and a half of walking. So it depends on your steps, step stride and all that kind of stuff. But I tell people, you know, three to five miles in that area of movement. 
you and know, you want to do that a day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. good. Okay, that's good. So that takes some time, takes some requirement. Hey, another thing I want to circle back to because it, it was so powerful, this idea of 2.91 positive versus negative reinforcement. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that. Is that what you're saying that it takes 2.91 positive uh, reinforcements to overcome a negative one? Is that what that is? Yeah, so no, they'd be in flourishing. Think about flourishing to languishing. Okay. Flourishing is that state where we're able to experience and enjoy and feel good about what we have. Okay. okay. Languishing is our, when we're in a state where we're feeling blah, we're not able to enjoy things that maybe we like. So for example, we're feeling a state where yeah, I don't feel like doing that tonight. Things we typically would enjoy doing, right? So flourishing is you have more charge. So think about a battery, you're higher charge, okay? okay. Yeah. So pause, the School of Positive Psychology is through 2000 studies have been looking at this saying that when we, because many human beings don't realize is that our executive brain is our logical brain, but our unconscious brain will do exactly what we tell it. So if we say we suck enough or we're not good enough, we all unconsciously develop you know, negative thinking. But if we can start practicing every day with intention, focusing on what we enjoy doing and be have gratitude. So gratitude, I know you're a big, that activates a part of your brain called the reptilian activating system. So for example, you're starting to manipulate your brain unconsciously to start to notice good because ah. we live in a 98-2 theory world that 98% is good. Like you have oxygen now, that's pretty cool. You can breathe but we'll focus on the 2% not yeah. working. So we put a higher negativity bias, mm. meaning I go like this. Hey, John, you're good. John, you're awesome. John, you're wonderful. John, you're this. John, you suck. What does the average person get? Yeah. The one suck outweighs the four good. Yeah. So our brain is naturally negative skewed. And there's a reason for survival because if you put your hand in a stove, we learn really quickly from things that are negative to try to go into self-protection. So a lot of us have learned automatically how to be pessimistic, to be worried. That's all self-protection. All these emotions are self-protection at a DNA level. We need them. So the research says if we can actually get up and then with intention train our brain, acts of kindness, three wins and a why. What are, every day, what are three things that work today and why? Um, mm -hmm. You know, being grateful. Um, uh, I have my, at my feet is my bulldog link. We'll go for walk and play ball. Like I can't, I, how can I be upset watching my bulldog chase a, you know, there's, it's impossible. So what happens is you, you have all these things you intentionally you can generate uh, people you're around, the friends you surround it. You, you know, yourself, you get someone you really enjoy. Yeah. They, you, the, it lights you up, right? Yes. So here's the theory, you know, Gottman did in his research, you want to be in a marriage five positive interactions to one unpleasant. You've got a chance. Human beings in the workplace, if I'm a leader, we want to pay attention to employees' experience and work like heck to create a place that's actually intentionally creating learning, more positive experiences. Mm -hmm. And this is not just about everyone feeling like, ha, 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 ha. Right. This is not positivity toxicity. This is about being able to, in those moments, learning a good life when we're feeling unwell as well. Yeah. Wow. You know? No, keep going. Well, first off, just real quick, I've got my dog, Nash. He's a Rhodesian Ridgeback at my feet. And, uh, <laughs> and also Ruby, she's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Uh, Nash is now 106 pounds. We, we're fostering him. You talked about being in a foster family, yep. right? Uh, yep. We're probably going to be a foster fail. We're probably going to adopt them, you know, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and Ruby is a 70 pound female, but there, you know, the, the love that you, you see from the, the animals is amazing, right? How much they enjoy each other, but really, like you said, just being with us. So what I want to do it go to, cause I think it's so important what you just laid out. So let's say someone is struggling. Someone's yeah. not getting all the things that, that you just said we need to have five to one in a relationship, you know, marriage, right. Work environment. What do we do? What, what, yeah. what do we do? Yeah. I think part of it is let's not, let's not assume people have mental illness to start with. Okay. Let's assume that people aren't broken. They're discouraged. Let's start okay. with that. Let's okay. assume, let's assume that people can learn through knowledge and skills and practice. 
So we can give people, I do it all the time. Like for example, if someone says to me, Bill, how do you help your human beings in the workplace develop? I say, well, there's five factors. One, my body, my emotions, my thoughts, my connections, my stabilizers. What do you mean by that, Bill? Well, under my body, we need to make sure we're paying attention to their biochemistry. Females between 40 and 55, they're, they might be having some hormone issues. Mm -hmm. Guys between 55 and 65 might be having some testosterone issues. That will impact how they show up. So it can be biochemistry. They may not be nutrition. It could be sleep. It could be hydration. It could be exercise. There could be issues. They could have an illness. They don't know. So we have to pay attention to our body. Okay. Get your get your cancer testing, get your blood work, go to your physicals, have a plan for your physical health. Then my emotions. We don't teach emotional literacy. We don't teach people how to regulate their emotions. Mm -hmm. If I told you the number of patients that showed up in my office that thought they were had anxiety or depression, where really it's reasonable, my wife left me, took my dog, took all my money, I'm upset, I'm anxious. You know, that's reasonable that if they didn't have the knowledge and skills, how to regulate that. So a lot of human beings do not understand how to deal with unpleasant emotions. So what do they do? They avoid them. That's why we have so much passive aggressive, unresolved conflict. People think anger is a, anger is not a bad emotion. It's a great emotion. It's very clear. Stop, start behavior. It's mm -hmm. what we do with anger. Anger, its own emotions are only neurochemicals. They don't tell you what to do. Uh, they don't tell you what to think. They're just like in your plane, all the lights. Yeah. Like there's a gas light. Get her, get, get her, the plane in the ground soon. Like this is a, this is frustration. Well, something that's mm -hmm. all it is. And then we teach people of that skill. The next one is my uh, thinking. A lot of people have faulty thinking. They don't understand it. They have limited believing about their potential. Mm -hmm. They've learned it. So instead of people saying, hey, suck it up, buttercup, those days are gone. We need to teach people how to learn, how to think, to believe in their own potential. We can do that. We do it in, in therapy all the time. Let's get upstream with it. Yeah. My connections, critical. How do you build, build positive self connections with yourself and other people? Those are, that's your mental fitness curriculum. Okay. And then the stabilizers are what employers can do in regards to, well, do you work remote or do you work like there's so many different behavior decisions employers can make that can create pleasant emotions. Money's money. Like I was saying to you earlier, real quick, and I, I'll just say it now, cause I think you'll get the point. A photocopier, a human being real quick photocopier. I believe we treat many times better than humans. Someone goes, what do you mean, Bill? Well, photocopier, we need money to get access humans. We need money, salary, get access photocopier. We need, you know, insurance to protect it from theft, fire. Human beings, we give them benefits, time off, insurances to protect them. Photocopier, we're quite willing to spend what on it to juice it, to drive it? Oh, let the thing called electricity. Oh, we'll pay for that. What's the juice for human beings? Don't mm. tell me it's money. It's, that's access. Don't tell me it's benefits. That's insurance. What's the juice that drives you? Oh, purpose, like safety, purpose, value, belonging, inclusion, feeling a part of a mission. Oh, okay. Then the photocopier, some lovely human being will come and maintenance it every 30 days from a preventive perspective. What's the prevention we do for him? Oh, we wait till they break. That's right. Until they raise their hand. So employers that can start to get their head around prevention and, and not running off and trying to it's plan, do, check, act. That's how you do this. Because yeah. lots of employers are, have great plans yeah. and they do stuff. Until they sit with the workers and say, hey, we're trying, is this actually working? Right. Is this helping? And then adjust and then repeat that thing. Yes. If you want to, because like KPMGs and all these massive consulting houses, they're all saying the same thing. Yep. Empathy and emotional well-being is one of the things that new, the new future of work is going to value the most in where they pick to go and stay. So this this concept of psych safety, real quickly, then I'll end it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to be the employer that wasn't talking about engagement 10 years ago. Right. Three years ago, you wouldn't want to be the employer not talking about inclusion and diversity. Right. Yep. Now you wouldn't want to be the employer talking about psych safety. How do we remove fear? How do we hold people accountable? How do we create learning cultures? How do we help human beings 
find how they can help each other. Like you, you, what you said with the blue, you guys learned how to help each other become the best version of yourselves. So you could actually do and thrive at what you do every day. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Let's um, go a little bit further on. I like your sure. plan, do, check, act. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard that many times. Um, uh, I like to uh, put a model out there that's very similar. Uh, I talked about instead of vision, plan, execute, feedback loop, which is another plan, do, yeah. check, act thing. Yeah. Um, I like to focus on belief levels because I think what's critical in vision is you got to get people to believe, right? Buy in. Um, then I go to the brief. Uh, the brief to me is the plan. So, but it's not just planning, it's actually preparation. Subtle difference there, Bill, right? Plans should already be made, but how do I prepare? So maybe this works in, in the idea of preventative. How do I prepare my, my mind, my body, my work, right? Um, am I aligned around a center point? That to me is getting the alignment. Um, I execute through high trust and then I debrief. And to me, that, that debrief is the critical part that you say is missing in the corporate world and really in everything. And I see it too, not just in results, but we really don't take the time to learn, to figure out what happened. You know, in the blues, again, why it's such a learning organization is we spend, we, 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 again, build in time to debrief so that we're learning every single day. Uh, and then that, that last arrow uh, that resets is the glad to be here and the glad yeah, to be yeah, here resets yeah. the belief levels. And now you get that exact spiral. Yeah. Positive feedback loop, like a feeling. Yeah, it's great. It's almost that's your currency that drives it, right? That's it it cool. is. That's it cool. is. So, so to help people here, I'm looking at, at our time. We, we should have you back. We're going to have you back because there's so much good stuff <laughs> here. Um, but I want to get back to this word habit. You said it takes, you know, nine months to make a baby and yeah. you said it like uh, 265 days or something, yeah, 291. What? Yeah, to get so really, if you think about you know any type of research, you talk about we want to move things. So if I come to you and I assess you, you're either unconsciously incompetent, you don't even know you're not, you don't know what you don't know. Then then I tell you you don't know calculus. Now you're consciously incompetent. Then I show you how to do the golf swing, and then you're focusing on everything. Now you're consciously competent because you kind of hit it. But tying your shoelaces, you're unconsciously competent. Yeah. How long does it take from once I make a decision to get something installed on unconscious competency, which becomes a habit, which creates its own positive feedback loop? Because willpower is a failed strategy for developing habits. It can kind of get you started, okay. but it's not going to keep you. Like pure accountability, there's all kinds of small chunks. So human beings who want to make big behavioral change our frustration tolerance, as many of us don't realize, it's not about 100%. It's about doing something 90% of the time over and over and over okay. so that it becomes its own positive feedback. So for me, walking today, I can't wait to go for my walk. Right. For me to pay attention, I can't wait because I know it's good for me or getting into bed at the same bedtime every night because I know it's good for me. But lots of people don't realize that to get to the point where I feel like if you think about weight loss. How many people focus on losing weight? Well, the problem is they're focused on losing weight, but they weren't focused on developing the habit to live healthy life. Mm, so what they do is they lose the 30 pounds and they put on 60. Because what happens is they held back, they were more focused on the outcome than the process. So mental health or physical health is about learning about the process of developing the habits and its own positive reward. So their dopamine reward system actually acknowledges and they do their own self-correction and they go, oh, okay, yeah, I slipped today. Okay. I had pizza today, but that's okay. Because if you punish yourself for being a human being, then you'll actually create guilt. And then you go into kind of a creates B and then, you know, like I ate the pizza and I feel guilty. Now I need the cheesecake to feel better about my pizza. Right. So we get into these kind of wild, you know, kind of loops. But I would say to you, the biggest one to simplify it is learning the curriculum, of learning how to develop resiliency. And sometimes people, depending on where they're starting, getting some help, getting some support, a mentor or guide, accountability, just to realize that there is no quick fix. There isn't a vitamin B12 shot to happiness. There, we have as a society of too many people are trying to say, and I hear this all the time, this patient would go to me one time and said, 
you know, that smoke sensation program wore off. Oh, and I go, oh, I'm really, really sorry about that. And I go, oh, well, you know, do you want me to refund your money? I'd say that really quiet. And they go, oh, no, no, doc. No, no, my, my wife left me. What they realized is they got back into a stress response. And a lot of us wow. relapse. And we we don't, being a human being is not a straight line. It's kind of like, boo, boo, boo. you're going all over the place to get to your goal. Yeah. But the problem is, John, why you're so passionate about Blue Angels? Because it gave you purpose. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So human beings, the absence of purpose, the absence of having something you can get lost in, like a passion. That's what we need. Humans need passion. Something where, like, I love writing, for example, John. Like, I can sit what? and start writing. Yeah, yeah. And then five hours goes by. I don't, you know, like, it's... Like I, I get lost, like you get into that flow state. Yeah. Right. That's what we need to teach people. This is a very trainable skill. Resiliency is not an innate skill. It's okay. a trainable skill. So, but it's a lifelong skill. There is no goal line. I keep saying that, but I apologize. It's, there's no goal line. No, I, 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 I feel it. I, I hear that. How do you, um, you mentioned two big things, passion and purpose. And I, I want to also reflect back to um, the idea of, of don't beat yourself up. I think you said it differently, you know, but like how uh, we can easily be our, our own worst kind of nightmare, you know, about that. So let's say somebody is searching for their passion and purpose. Mm. They don't have it yet. And, uh, and how can they be positive to themselves? What any tools or techniques? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give you one because I want to share a story because I think it might help make the point. In life, all of us will have adversity. So behind you, you have like a football helmet. I have a football helmet. So one of the things I really quickly help get this point is that the, how do you get it? You need to try something. Okay. And you have to be open to the possibility that you're going to fail. And you'll be open to the possibility on that process you're going to learn, right? So real quickly, for me, when I was in university and when I went to Acadia University in Canada, I was a kid who couldn't basically read when I got there, but I had football and I wasn't a really, really good football player, but I was, a, I used it as a creative discipline, a creative structure and et cetera. Okay. But here's where adversity comes. I, and I hope this, you can relate to this. So my first year I had a brainstem concussion. My second oh. year I tore my pack off. My third year, I was a wide receiver or a tight end, sorry. And they moved me into the third year into a left tackle because I played basketball and I had pretty good feet. And I had to get bigger. And there's, here was a moment where I actually can answer your question. So in the spring, one of one of my peers came up to me. He said, hey, Bill, he said, what are you going to do next year? And so I'm going to try to make the left tackle. I guess that's what they want me to try to do. I'm going to work real hard on it. He said, Bill, you wouldn't have a snowball chance <laughs> in hell of doing that. And I looked at that moment. All of a sudden, a light, it was the biggest gift anyone ever gave me. I went home that summer. I never went out once. I trained all summer. I put weight on. I came in. I was the second strongest guy in the team. Whoa. Started. And I ended up, you know, getting most improved player in my fourth year. And the reason I did is I gave myself permission to try. Uh, and I gave myself permission to go all in, to try knowing that because I left it, put it all out. And, and, and the reason I was able to, I had supports. Didn't do it by myself. I had people believing in me trying. And that's how we do it. We have to pick something, John. Doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. Believe in trying and then work your supports and maybe and maybe accept the possibility that life is hard. No one says it's going to be easy. And adversity is really what, if the more we can learn to accept that good days are going to come, they're going to go. Bad days are going to come and going to go. As long as we have what our purpose is, that can give us a juice to start again tomorrow. Wow. So powerful. So meaningful for so many people. You know, Bill, you got a new book coming out. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. And uh, and when can we pre-order that? I think it's in July, right? Yeah, we can start pre-ordering in July. So this will be the trilogy in my mental fitness series. I wrote a book. I believe there's three things that are sticking people in language. My first book, Stop Hiding, was about how to move out of fear. I was based on a life story where I failed grade two. And I want to show people how I went through it using a fit model. Second book, the second part was around connection. I feel a lot of people haven't been taught how to build relationship with themselves and others. So it was called the cure to loneliness. So relationships and fear. 
The third book, I see a lot of people stuck in regret. Mm. Now, the, I named it No Regret. It's impossible that you're going to have no regret. But the reality is, particular regrets in your life, you can distinguish one at a time. Whether it's something you made a mistake, because it's a powerful transformational emotion, or something you haven't yet tried. And I see a lot of human beings settling for second best because they haven't learned how yet to believe in who they could be. They're mm. stuck in the version of who other people say they are or what they actually start to believe them in themselves. So bloody, many people will limit themselves so they can't let themselves down anymore. So to me, that's books focus on developing emotional well-being. And all my books, John, very much like you, I'm a teacher. So they're all built to, to be designed that no human being will have the same journey. So in the book, there's different ingredients. And based on your needs, you can create a plan to pick the right ingredients to help you unlock what potentially could be holding you in that unpleasant emotion. Wow. Is um, Where do I go to, to pre-order? For something? Any of the great retailers like the Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon's, uh, uh, and like, and I apologize. There's a whole bunch of them. It's being we're releasing it globally through Macmillan in the in October, doing the pre-releases. My goal, John, is and I and I'm learning how not to be shy. Is my last book was a bestseller, and the reason the advantage I think of being a bestseller, you get the people's attention, like folks like yourself that can help get the word out. Because my mission in life is to become what I teach, oh, and nice. so what I really want to do is get I get information I'm. That, that I want more people to, you know, get some ideas because I'm, I'm, I believe I have a voice that can help. Yeah. What is, what's your personal I am statement? Do you have, as you define yourself, I am blank. How would you answer that? No, I, it may, it may not be what you expect. Okay. I'm good enough as I am today. Uh, and I, it took me the pandemic to learn that. And I think I had Dr. Bill, who was like, you know, really super confident guy. And then I have Bill. Mm. Bill is just learning that he's good enough, which is coming into my work, which is quite, you know, I think a pandemic, <clears throat> a divorce, uh, major breakup. Uh, challenge with your kids, you start to, and you're locked in a, you know, in a new city by yourself for a couple of years, you have two choices either feel sorry for yourself or get after who you want to become. Hmm. That's what I focused on getting after what I want to become. Wow. I liked it. I am enough today. Tell me that again. I, I am good, good enough as I am today. I am good enough as I am today. Wow. That's powerful. Especially um, it, it puts you in the present moment, right? Yeah. And it also relieves you of any guilt or shame, Right. And, and empowers you by saying, um, hey, I, you know, you're actually giving yourself, um, I guess, acknowledgement uh, that, that you're exactly where you need to be. That's, a, that's powerful, Bill. Yeah. And I, and I think a part of it, to be quite honest, I learn every day and I love yeah. like I take stuff from our talk and reflect. Yeah. But I have spent 57 years saying, trying to th well, not think I was good enough as I am. And I think that holds us back. Yeah. Any of us need to understand that this moment we have right now, this is it. We don't live in the past. We don't live in the future. We live right now. If you could remember that where you are in the moment, you actually can feel who you are. I think many mm. of us are missing our life. We're in the we're over there saying where it could be, but you're right here. This could be the best moment of your life. Right. But if you're not noticing, you're going to miss it. Wow. So, uh, so meaningful. I, I know this last hour has been super meaningful to me. I, mean, I, I, I want to do two things before we wrap up. Uh, I want to talk about the pandemic and uh, because you mentioned how uh, it's, it's been incredibly helpful to you. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that, that you get a chance to talk about also um, how you overcame that childhood, you know, the third bucket, right. Um, uh, and uh I want to make sure we get those those two things in. So your your choice, go first. Yeah, I'll I'll take the bucket real quick, and then you know because I think they're I think they're the same. See, yeah. I think what happens, you you know what imposter syndrome is, right? So I think well, yeah, I've heard about it. I can't pretty, say I actually know it. Yeah, I'm so not I saying think, that from an ego. Yeah, uh, no, I think a lot. I think a lot of us show up 
but like, you know, we have expectations. So, you know, I'm a doctor and I have I've written all these books and you must have it all together. That's the top of the iceberg. But underneath, you know, there's stuff going on. Got it. So, and so what I realized is that I had during the pandemic, I had a, a major breakup that happened to me where I thought for the first time in my life, like, you know, you know, not because you, you're given up and all that kind of stuff. I realized that breakup actually opened up an opportunity where I had to actually deal with not the breakup, but with my parts of my kid where I was rejected and all the trauma. And what happened for me is I actually realized trauma is real. And but it's not about curing. It's about understanding how to manage the symptoms of your experience. I can't change the abuse that happened to me. I can't change the things that happen. I can't change those things. And if you told people, they'd be horrified. Mm-hmm. But what happens is, is that's my experience. And what I realized during the pandemic, and this is really interesting. I mean, I'm ADHD. I, for the first time, went on medications, changed my life. Oh, it's in denial, but so it's an executive functioning disorder. So I knew that because I'm a doctor and I probably told all kinds of people people on medication, but yeah. surely hell I could beat it. So what happens is, is I want a medication that changed. I went to therapy for the first time, wow. believe it or not. I went, I worked a year. I had two different therapists, one working on this, one working on that. I was doing work. I spent every day, about an hour a day, every day on my mental health, starting with my journaling my morning routine, my meditation, all that kind of stuff. And I realized I've started to develop a skill for me. So what happens is, is that that's why, why I'm so excited is because I'm starting to realize, holy moly, yeah. the only thing that's held me back from believing is me. Wow. So, what's, so I use the pandemic to help me sort a lot of stuff. Am I done yet? No. Will I ever be? No. But it actually gets quite cool because I really realized that many of us just haven't had a chance to create space for us, space just to figure some stuff out, like like that taking some space to figure it out and putting yourself in a position to be vulnerable. That's probably, if you were to say one word for me, it's like, I think I'm a walking accommodation. I don't have any shame on who, who I am because I don't take myself too serious. A lot of people take me serious, John, because I, you know, <laughs> you, but I don't, I, I'm, but the other thing is, is that, you know, guys in Wall Street would tell you this. I won't do a name drop. I've worked with people on the cover of Fortune magazine. I'm a per dunder son. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't care who you are. Yeah. I'm not impressed by people's wealth or power. I'm impressed by a person who shows up and are authentic and can actually give kindness. I don't care who they are. That's what I watch for. If they, wow. when they walk in the building, do they say hello to everybody or do they mm-hmm. just say to, to hello to people's status? Right. I, I pay attention. It's a person to me. It's the most important thing. Bill, I think that for me was one of the most powerful things we've said uh, during this whole talk here. Uh, I sure hope people stayed on and listened. I mean, I, I, I was uh, I, I was engaged the whole time, um, but that's that's so powerful. And I can feel your passion to now share that with the world, to give that back, to use what you've learned as yourself, and now and then tie them back to all the education you've had, all the uh, work experience where you know how to connect the dots. Because it's one thing for you to have the aha. But um, one thing I've learned, and again, back in in the Navy was, I don't want just an athlete who's good at at, at the sport or or a good pilot. I need someone who can teach it. I need someone who can coach it. I need someone who understands it, but also understands how to position it and how so someone else can benefit. And that's what I feel is probably one of your greatest skills. I can't wait to read some of your books and, and, <laughs> uh, and, and hear about all the good work you're, you're out there doing. Um, I'd like to kind of uh, bring this home with uh, two thoughts. One is uh, I always like to know how people live their life. You know, is there a certain, um, you mentioned your dad a long time ago, you know, your dad is, is your greatest teacher. Um, I know for me too, you know, he was my hero. And um, uh, so what did you learn from your dad that you still um, really cherish? Yeah. I think one of the biggest ones that I've, and I'm actually a little slow getting there, but it's the, is the art of 
listening a little bit longer, asking a few more questions, listening a little bit longer, asking a few more questions, and being comfortable that you don't have to have all the answers, yeah. and being really, really clear that human beings are all having their own experiences, and that your experience could be same, worse, better, but everyone's trying to do their best they can with what they know to be true for them. And I, and I and kind of, so for me, it's his, he was his uh, humility too about it. He like, he, he played sports. I didn't even, I, my dad never even talked about his sports stuff. Like he mm -hmm. was, he was, but you hear it vicariously from other people. This is that concept of helping. And that's interesting that being a, bartender he did so much stuff supporting people with addictions you know like he'd take their money put it in a can call the wife and say hey, i got your grocery money wow with alcoholics i watched that as a kid wow he used to take them home and the guys were in bad shape they'd be in the trunk you know in the trunk but the back seat of his car you know all of a sudden you wake up and you're running the house some of the yeah he was too bad i couldn't send him home wow. so i just let him sleep it off in the back of the car and like this would be in the summer not in the winter of course right but it was just watching those behaviors and that what motivated me to move towards addictive disorders. And that's why I did my postdoc UCLA school of medicine, addictive disorders. I, I wanted to know as much as I could. I published, written, did research on this area for a long time wow. because of him. Amazing. Hey, what, um, the other thing that, that I, that interests me and it, it's powerful that the story of your dad, you know, I, I feel you living through, you watched him, right? And so he didn't have to teach from words. He taught by actions. Yes. You know, and I think about my dad too. I don't need a definition of character integrity. I just think of my dad, you know, because there were so many actions that, that, yep. that. and my mom was love and, and, and compassion really. Um, uh, I've got a, a struggle, my own personal one. I'll just share with everybody. I, I don't think I, I need to work on empathy. I, I don't think I have a good skill set on empathy. At least um, I've been told that. And I think it's true. So, um, you know, I know that empathy is part of compassion. Um, and I, I'm trying to get better at it. And I like what you said about listening more and asking questions. So uh, let's, how can myself or anybody that wants to be more at work on an empathy, what do you do? Sure. First, we have to define what empathy is. It's the Good. absence of judgment. Oh, nice. I never and thought to find it. It's the openness to understand their experience. Ah. So really what the, what the concept is, you have, what's called a, you have what's called your referential frame of reference. You have a model of your world, right. of how things should be. However, someone who is, shows up with empathy starting for themselves is a possibility that they don't have to be perfect or judge themselves, et cetera, that they can make mistakes, even at the most inconvenient time. Like you might say something to someone that they break up with you and you go, oh, God, that sucks. But they're human beings because in relationships, human beings have this unique power. They get to pick you, you get to pick them. Yeah. That's how it works. And so when you move into the concept of empathy is one of the things to check out is to ensure that the other person, by simply saying this, John is saying, Listen, I just heard you. This is what I think you said. And, and is that your experience? And make sure you're under the experience. And then, then ask them, what, what's my role here to help you if there is a role? Mm. And, and instead of actually imposing our opinions or imposing our judgment or imposing our great ideas, empathy is really being able to sit with other people. And I understand they're going to have differences. And here's where the problem is. Again, it may not be convenient because you want to get them to move on. Right, right. Because you're judging through what your model of the world is, how quick you should know this by now. Modal operators and the necessity, judging people. Oh, we've talked about this nine times, John. <laughs> you know, like that is imposing your model. But what happens if someone's actually doing something because they're doing it for compliance to fit in? Versus accepting it could be a competency could help me as a human being become better. So many of us are actually pulled towards the Borg by what we think others think we're supposed to be thinking. Mm. Versus that again, us. we think others. Many of us get pulled because we're thinking we think what we think because what others think we should be thinking 
versus us thinking what we want to think. Right. So in other words, like group think, yeah. like we take on roles. If, if you're around a group of guys, you know this, cause you would have that military background and you've seen this where we said, you know, you know, and sometimes it's pejorative, you know, this, we call somebody, Hey, you know, you're, you're messy. You know what? You're always messy. You're not organized. They will actually take that role on of being unorganized and messy sometimes. Oh, wow. And they don't really realize, but that becomes a part of their identity because the group for me to fit in is I need to be messy and organized Interesting. versus going, no, 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 that's not me. And I'm going to be organized. So you get tired of calling me unorganized. But lots of us, without realizing, if you say to your children, you know something, yeah, I'm disappointed. Then children over time will start actually showing up oh. expecting you to be disappointed because wow. that's my role. And that's how I get affection from you. Because if I disappoint you, you'll pay attention to me. And so we don't realize that the environment creates roles. Like that's Jack. He's not the smart one. Or that's Fred or Jill. And like, and that's empathy is really not judging people by one event. It's mm-hmm. how they're showing up each day trying and not holding things. Like empathy is allowing people to release lots of us hold things that happened. Like, you know, I did something to you and yeah, that's bill. He was rude to me. Mm-hmm. And you tell everyone I'm rude. So you're always, maybe not you, not you clearly, but a lot of people will think, Oh, we think, Oh, Bill's this, this way. So that's my reputation gets kind of formed based off of one thing versus say, Hey, what have, what happened to Bill that day? I wonder, Oh, maybe his wife left him. What else could it be other than, his whole world revolves around upsetting me. <laughs> like so many of us think that I got up in the morning to upset the other person, which is not true. That's empathy, John. Wow. You know, thank you for that. Uh, the first sentence really blew me away. I always ex- uh, would define empathy as being able to feel what another person is feeling. So I, I and I realize now it's totally wrong. It's, now, I wouldn't it's, say it's totally wrong. I, well, I, would, I, I think what happens is, is you're equating it that somehow by you feeling what they're feeling, that's going to create meaning to them without you understanding why they feel that way. Right. So if change it, just change your language a little bit. Empathy is the absence of judgment to understand what their experiences is and being curious. That's driving their feelings. Yeah. I can work on that because I know I bring judgment to it. And so the absence of judgment is so huge because, you know, I think that I've got a model that works in my mind that should work in your mind, right? Well, it doesn't. That, that's obvious. That's what the, you're, or you may not have the skills yet. You yes. See? So what happens is they might get there because they might want to fly like you're suggesting. But what if it takes them six months to learn yeah, to fly? Because yeah. sometimes, John, we forget it took us many years to learn to fly. Yes. Yeah. Many experiences. And, and I think we learn from the, the failures and the challenges the most. You talked so. about pandemic and your experience. Yeah. Holy cow. This has been so beneficial. I, I don't want to end because I got one more question. I just reminded sure. something yeah. is the, 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 the RAS, right? You mentioned that earlier. I always understood it as the reticular activating system. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I don't understand it, but I realized, so, so let me, let me, let's define it real quick because I, I was told once in the positive psychology literature yeah. that the RAS either it's, it's in the base stem, right? Yeah, and it, yeah, and, it, yeah. and yeah. it either lets only two things come through, either a threat or an opportunity. Now that may have been um, not scientific, right? The person yeah. who was saying it, but it, it resonated with me. I went, oh, interesting. So I'm either going to see that, you know, duality. I'm either going to see something as a threat or an opportunity. Is that true? And really what directionally, does the RAS do? Directionally, I think it's a, it's a lay person way of going. I get it, but I would add to you, it's what Please. we put attention to and meaning. So what happens is if you bought a yellow punch buggy, what do you brain without realizing you start noticing yellow punch buggy because you attach some positive meaning to it. So that was an okay. opportunity benefit. Same thing for a threat. Somebody, you know, you start picking things up and start reacting to, to a certain level. But what I think is many of us don't realize that we are actually really good at finding what's good in the world. No, what's wrong with the world. Yeah. Gratitude changes your intention to sit with what's good in the world. So when you start practicing gratitude or doing things of acts of kindness or three wins and a why, 
your unconscious brain goes, well, a lot of good stuff happening, a lot of good stuff happening, a lot of good. Stuff. Now what we're doing is spending more brain horsepower training our brain that we're safe. It's good. My life is okay. I'm living a life. And so many of us haven't yet figured out what's, what's living a good life mean to you. There you go. You know what I mean? So that's, you're on that point. It's, you're not far off at all. Wow. So, so many brilliance. Um, definitely want to follow up with you. I also want to make sure everybody knows how to uh, uh, get a hold of you. What's sure. the best way for someone to exchange with you? Yeah, you can go through my website, billhowitt.com. And that'd be the easiest way to find my, my per, I put my direct email. I respond to all emails myself. Uh, I find that I like the personal touch much like you. And then I get my team to help me when I need it. Right. But it, for that's the easiest way, billhowitt.com. Pretty easy. Google's a wonderful friend. H-O-W-A-T-T. Beautiful. And make sure everybody, we want to do the pre-orders because as you know, yes, pre-orders yes. help. Get yes. that bestseller going Thank and, you. Uh, at whatever retailer. Uh, and the book again, No Regrets. What's the subtitle? Or... You, you, can, you could read it. It'd be good. I'm, I'm ADHD. I can't remember. Oh, no, no. Good. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I got it down here. No Regrets, How to Live Today for Tomorrow's Emotional Well-Being. Yeah, there you go. That sounds, I could remember the No Regrets, John. Yeah, no, that's so <laughs> honest, Bill. I guess when you write 50 books, uh, that, could, that could happen. Um, Listen, I, I thank you. I want to I want to end on the glad to be here. The the power of gratitude. Uh, I, I do want to know one thing. And that is, is there a certain saying, a certain quote, a certain uh, mantra that you um, live your life by that you want to share with everybody? Yeah, I, to me, I it's interesting you say that. It's the the biggest thing I try to do each day is remind myself every day I have another chance. Nice. That's my mantra. I have another chance. And, and I, I, I pray a lot. I forgive, you know, for, you know, I, I find prayer very powerful for me. Yeah. Me too. But I like every day saying, I got another chance. I got another chance. And that's what I say. I, cause you know what? I, I, I just accept the fact is a high probability I'm going to make mistakes, but I got another chance. Nice. I love that. That leads into the glad to be here. I think that could define the glad to be here means I have another chance. I'm grateful that I have the opportunity. I have another chance. I want to, um, nice. I, I want to thank you. Uh, I I'll be straight with you. I've been doing a lot of stuff on, you know, mental wellness and stuff. And, and I'm, I'm like, man, I'm getting tired about this. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm going, you know, I know Bill's, but you just blew me away. I will say with all the other discussions I've had on psychological safety and environment, nobody, has encapsulated as powerful as you have. Oh, and uh, okay. and I, I really think you helped me, but I know you helped a lot of people on this call. And most importantly, um, I sure hope a lot of people uh, get exposed to you in a deeper way. A lot of companies, I know you go in there as a consultant, you can make a difference in people's lives. And I like what you say, it's not a program, right? There's well, no goal line here. With your permission, John, yeah. one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you a little white paper that maybe you might attach with the podcast people have easy, easy read. Beautiful. On how to create things to consider for creating a psychological safe workplace. Beautiful. And I use an example of humans to machines. And I try to help lay it out because I really feel a lay person. I also will send you a, a CEO playbook for creating a psychological safe workplace. That's what we need. We'll get that out to everybody on this. So that's beautiful. Well, I'm going to let you wrap the podcast uh, with uh, a glad to be here share out. Why are you glad to be here? I actually, uh, to, be, to be honest with you, is I did not have a clue what to expect. <laughs> so I, I'm very, very grateful for someone who's helping as many people as you are, is the energy, the passion, how you showed up. You didn't know me from Adam. So I'm grateful for the kindness. Uh Thank you, Bill. Acts of kindness, right? That's what I'm learning from you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Everybody, uh, it's, it's a blessing. Glad to be here. See you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.